This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, friends and colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's lecture. It's a great privilege to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University, the sponsor of today's proceedings. Um, our center is dedicated to studying some of the religious foundations and dimensions of issues of law, politics, and society. Working with some 80 faculty from around the campus and 1,600 scholars from around the world, our center offers a variety of specialized courses, joint degree programs, clinical internships, visiting fellows, two book series, advanced research projects, and a number of public lectures, conferences, and forums such as this one. This afternoon, we return to the contested line, if not the contorted wall, between church and state and religion and politics. The main text for our meditation today are the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The main reality today is that the First Amendment religion clauses have been considerably weakened over the past 15 years by U.S. Supreme Court case law. And in response, Congress and state legislatures around the country have stepped into the breach with alacrity passing hundreds of special statutes and regulations, appropriations, and occasional earmarks in support of religion. And the main question that we want to debate together today is whether all this has helped or hindered the cause of religion and the cause of religious freedom for all. Are these in part just legislative concessions that are providing religion with the benefits that traditionally were available to religion in the federal courts using judicial review and the free exercise and establishment clauses? Are these just classic pieces of legislative pork and perks given on behalf of majoritarian religions and at the behest of strong statesmen and stateswomen? Are these ingredients of a religious affirmative action program that is seeking to undo decades of religious exclusion and discrimination born of a zealous application of a logic of strict separation between church and state? These are among the several questions that we want to deliberate together today. And leading us in our deliberation is a brilliant reporter from the New York Times, Ms. Diana B. Enriquez. Educated at George Washington University, a Guggenheim Fellow at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School, she has served as the financial reporter of the New York Times since 1989. She has filled the pages of the Times with scores of stories on issues of white-collar crime, and financial fraud, corporate governance, securities litigation, and more. She has published three books on those same topics, and she has lined her office walls with all manner of special prizes and awards for her work in journalism. And a few of them include the George Polk Award, the Goldsmith Prize, the Worth Bingham Prize, the Front Page Award, and the Gerald Loeb Award, which she won twice over. For of the past five years, she has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and this year again, she is a finalist for that same coveted prize because of her sterling four-part series on issues of religion and government that filled the pages of the Times last fall. And it's that four-part series and continued investigative and reporting work that she has done with her colleagues that is the subject of her address today. It's been a great privilege, Ms. Enriquez, to welcome you to our Emory community to enjoy these lively and learned conversations with you and with our colleagues. It's a privilege to welcome you to this distinguished lectern 
where we have had Jimmy Carter and Desmond Tutu and Martin Marty, Menachem Alon, and literally hundreds of distinguished scholars from around the world stand here and edify the community. We expect no less from you, madam, and we welcome you with a robust round of applause to this lectern. Now, I was hoping to operate under the thesis of low expectations. <laughs> I need to just uh, uh, amend and uh, correct a bit of, uh, of that lovely and kind introduction, John, for which I thank you. Uh, the New York Times has uh, repeatedly nominated me for uh, the honor of a Pulitzer. Um, I sometimes say that that's the toughest competition in journalism. They only get three nominations a year in each category. Um, but I have only once been an official finalist, and that was in 2005. Um, uh, that they make these distinctions, and Columbia University cares a lot about it. So I'm, I, I want to be sure that since this is being recorded, that we've got that straight. Um, I also appreciate the invitation to come here and add my amateur's view uh, to this uh, intriguing topic of uh, that roving line between church and state. But I have to underline amateur several times because I would otherwise blush to have anything to offer on this topic uh, in a room filled with so much uh, accumulated wisdom and expertise on it. I should say immediately, too, that my remarks here today, uh, to the extent that they uh, deviate from the purely factual, uh, are my own and do not represent the views of the New York Times. The Times also cautions us to be careful, as reporters in public commentary, uh, not to go beyond anything that we could, in fact, say in print. Fortunately, I've said so much in print <laughs> about this topic, a mortifying 22,000 words in the, uh, in the uh, series, uh, that the Times rule still leaves me a lot of room to maneuver. As John noted in his introduction, I'm a financial reporter, both by long training and also, I think, almost by inclination. And I usually direct my attention to the behavior and regulation of for-profit uh, businesses. After the terrorist attacks of uh, September 11th, however, I did spend more than a year covering the national charities and local charities that sprang up to respond to those events. So the nonprofit world is not completely unknown to me. What was completely new to me, though, was this constitutional minefield of the Establishment Clause. Until I started this research, in fact, my last memorable encounter with this church-state issue um, uh, was back when I was a second grader, uh, and I was required to memorize the 100th Psalm in my public school classroom in Roanoke, Virginia. I was clearly a very impressionable second grader because I can still recite it for you. I, you know, all the way from, you know, make a joyful new noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, serve the Lord with God, right unto, and his truth endureth for all generations. So I, uh, I've carried that with me from that public school classroom. Um, the state, Virginia, in that case, uh, was perfectly willing, willing to let the church have its Bible verses uh, in my public school classroom back then, so long as there weren't any African-American children in that classroom with me while we memorized them. After the federal courts intervened to start changing that situation, I had my second memorable encounter with this church-state divide. This time it was in my Baptist Sunday school in Florida, where my teacher sternly drilled us on all the Bible verses that prove that God endorsed racial seg segregation and the state should too. Clearly I had become a lot less impressionable because I can't remember a single one of those scriptural verses today. But my journey back into this issue uh, started actually in May 2005 when I came across an article in Harper's Magazine uh, in which author Jeff Charlotte examined the history and the religious sociology of the New Life Community Church in Colorado Springs, the one founded and until recently run by the Reverend Ted Haggard. I started reading it casually on the bus and couldn't put it down and finished it somewhere around midnight. But when I was done, I was hungry for what wasn't in that fabulous story, um, which was information about the economic and the financial life of this gigantic church and its dealings with all the government agencies that I knew from long experience had to have been involved in its growth. Property tax assessors, planning boards, building code enforcement agencies, the agencies that license television and radio stations, and so forth. So as always, my first impulse as a financial reporter was to go to the documents. 
in the aftermath of 9-11, I'd learned my way around the annual disclosure documents that nonprofits are requi required to file, the Form 990s. So the next morning, I started looking for a Form 990 for this fascinating Colorado Springs church. And that's when I discovered that the IRS does not require churches, even giant ones like this, to file 990s, although much smaller secular nonprofits are required to do so. That was the first religious regulatory exemption that I came across. Um, and I, I'll admit, it did not immediately suggest the course of reporting I eventually followed. It just suggested that examining the life of some big religious institutions was going to be a lot harder than I initially thought it would be. But then a nonprofit accounting expert that I had consulted explained that that 990 filing exemption uh, was just one of many special IRS rules uh, that applied only to religious institutions. Hmm, and I thought that was a little bit more interesting and took the time to sit down with my editor, uh, talk with him about the uh, thoughts that that was suggesting to me. And he thought it sounded intriguing um, and suggested I keep looking. Then I tracked down a, a sociology professor who specializes in studying very large churches in America to see if he had any advice about how to examine their financial life in any systemic way. At the end of our conversation, just as an aside, he mentioned that a former student of his who now served on the board of a nonprofit daycare center in Alabama had recently told him that her state licensed center was struggling to compete in the marketplace against a church run against church run daycare centers um, that were exempt from state licensing requirements and therefore could charge far less for uh, the daycare services that they provided. Well, I understand markets. Um, that throwaway comment really grabbed my attention and started to move my thinking around to the course uh, that I finally followed. It's a long-standing joke and my business journalists in the, in the room will recognize it that three data points make a trend. It's a corollary of the law that news is what happens near an editor. So, so I had three data points. I wasn't sure if I had a trend. Uh, so I started to sift through federal regulations, the Federal Register, congressional bills, state regulatory agency websites, looking for other faith-based uh, regulation exemptions. By October of, 25, uh, of 2005, the list had gotten long enough, and many of those exemptions were recent enough that my editor agreed that this was definitely a vein of reporting worth pursuing, and we started to frame the thesis that led ultimately um, to the series In God's Name. Uh, as those of you who have labored, uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily, uh, through the resulting series already know, we found a large and a growing roster of religious exemptions and tax breaks. Besides the IRS rules and the state daycare licensing exemptions I've already mentioned, that list included expanding property tax exemptions, covering such non-traditional real estate as upscale retirement homes, uh, biblical theme parks, and a church-run fitness center with a tanning bed, an increasingly broad judicial ban on lawsuits against religious employers by their employees, a limitation that had traditionally been enforced just against clergy members, but that more recently was being applied to religious school teachers, choir directors, religious college professors, and even a Catholic bishop's press secretary. We found special visa programs for religious workers, repeatedly renewed by Congress, and court-imposed limitations on unionizing et, uh, efforts by religious employees. There were numerous tax exemptions for religious nonprofits, including a federal income tax for clergy members' housing expenses, and exemptions from state unemployment taxes that are not available to other tax-exempt organizations. Congress had adopted special federal protections for religious landowners involved in local zoning disputes and exemptions from federal pension and social security rules for the clergy, along with occasional federal legislation creating exemptions from those exemptions. Some of these exemptions were deeply rooted in the nation's history and, like the property tax exemption, were simply taken for granted. But we found that Congress, since the 101st Congress in 1989, had enacted more than 200 bills that gave new exemptions or special treatment uniquely to religious organizations in general or to specific religious institutions in particular. 
taken along with the fact that Congress and the White House had also made federal contracting rules more accommodating towards religious organizations seeking public funds, this roster of exemptions and tax breaks suggested that the fierce rhetoric of the last few years about a war on religion in America was somewhat off the mark, at least with respect to the institutional interests of religious organizations. That resulting series, In God's Name, I have to say was one of the most intriguing and intellectually satisfying projects I've ever done. Uh, it was also one of the most controversial. Um, to judge from the deluge of letters and, uh, and emails uh, that uh, we got in the aftermath of its publication. Now my previous project uh, before this one which focused on uh, the financial exploitation of young service members with uh, uh, dubious and, and expensive life insurance and mutual fund products I had also produced uh, a almost record-setting avalanche of responses from our readers. But whereas readers back then wanted to pat me on the back and give me a medal and, and cheer me uh, around, the, around the course for a victory lap, the messages this time were nowhere near as universally flattering. In fact, turning the other cheek became a daily exercise. I think it helped tighten my jawline a little. Uh, you might want to try it. Um, by a substantial majority, most of the Times readers <coughs> who wrote to us said that they were grateful for this reality check and were concerned that it reflected a narrowing in the separation of church and state. But there were other readers who saw this series as an insane call for increased regulation of religion and still others who felt I was insufficiently appreciative of both the First Amendment and the benefits that religious organizations deliver to society in exchange for those exemptions. Now, as I explained to them, I've lived my whole adult life on, as a journalist under the protections of the First Amendment. If freedom of religion can correctly be called the first freedom, um, freedom of the press crosses the finish line right, right after, the next ten words. So I'm a big fan of the First Amendment. And as a lifelong church member, I not only appreciate the good works uh, that faith-based organiz organizations do, but I help support them with both my time and my money. But I emerged from this dialogue with readers and critics in the blogosphere with a fresh appreciation for the difficulties and tensions that surround this seemingly simple phrase, separation of church and state, which I call three nouns in search of an elusive verb. Three nouns, none of which is understood in quite the same way by various partisans in this debate. What do we mean by separation? My reporting and my subsequent engagement with readers made it clear that separation was sometimes defined as requiring special treatment for religious organizations to protect them from the perceived interference of government regulators and tax collectors and sometimes defined as requiring government neutrality towards religious organizations to protect them from being discriminated against in the distribution of public benefits and public funds. This tension between extending special treatment because of a group's religious character and extending neutral treatment despite a group's religious character emerged as one of the core issues in the landscape of church and state and one that I think seems likely to dominate legislative and judicial developments going forward. I sympathize and am somewhat drawn to the arguments that are being made so eloquently by Chris Eisgruber of Princeton and Larry Sagan of the University of Texas in their new book, Religious Freedom and the Constitution. They have argued that separation is simply the wrong word in the wrong place at the wrong time. The church engages in too many activities regulated by the state from employment to land use for that concept to be useful in any way, they argue. And they continue, quote, the question is not whether the state should be permitted to affect religion or religion permitted to affect the state. The question is how they should be permitted to affect each other. So much for separation. What about our next noun, church? In one of those great insights that only come at the end of a long project, not in the beginning when we would really uh, need them, uh, I have come to see that most of the hostility toward my series arose from the elusive way that society defines church in this phrase. Some of my readers clearly assumed that by church I meant religion and that by religion I meant a system of beliefs and devotional practices. 
But in fact, I'm a financial writer. By church, I meant religious institutions, which have institutional needs and goals, just as for-profit organizations do, that stand quite apart from matters of faith and doctrine. I understand that there are still a lot of hot button issues over public endorsement of particular religious iconic displays and devotional practices, disputes that get branded in heated rhetoric as a war on religion. But that does not negate the fact that the state government at all levels has increasingly acted to accommodate the institutional needs and goals of religious organizations. No one has ever claimed that there is a religious belief or devotional practice that I'm aware of that is offended if religious employers are required to pay state unemployment taxes and therefore provide jobless religious workers with unemployment benefits. Now, I fully understand that religious employers would rather not pay those taxes. Indeed, I suspect that many secular employers would rather not pay those taxes either. But at a factual level, that debate over unemployment taxes doesn't have anything to do with anyone's religious beliefs. It is rooted in the institutional life of religious organizations and in the political power they have and quite understandably have used to obtain that particular institutional advantage. What I set out to explore in this series was exactly that institutional territory. But what I learned at the end of my journey was that the public knows almost nothing about that landscape. And it's no wonder. Highly visible religious advocates almost exclusively describe this war on religion as a dispute over beliefs. Perhaps their critics say because it's easier to raise funds from the faithful for a battle over beliefs than for a battle over tax breaks. Ordained ministers on the national political stage never pause in their attacks on the godless secular progressive government to thank Uncle Sam for that nice tax break on their housing expenses, which for some of these fellows is quite a valuable accommodation indeed. So going forward, I'm going to be more careful to distinguish between those two defining concepts of church in this debate, <clears throat> between issues that are rooted in belief and those that are rooted in institutional needs and goals. Perhaps that's a useful way for you to think about these issues as well. Finally, in parsing separation of church and state, we come to that seemingly obvious noun, state. Most of the angry readers who contacted me clearly think that state, in this context, encompasses only the US Supreme Court. And some of them made it clear that they're not going to see the state as being more accommodating toward religion until abortion is illegal and school-sponsored prayer is not. Other readers understood that the state encompassed at least the whole federal government, but they were largely unaware of the remarkable accommodations that state legislatures and local tax assessors have adopted in recent years. Indeed, Professor Witte told me that a former student of his here had found more than a thousand separate uh, religious accommodations built into state and county um, ordinances here in Georgia alone. Going forward, I think that much more of the church-state conflict is going to arise in state legislatures and state regulatory offices. Unless the media keep up with that trend, the public will continue to think of separation of church and state primarily as a beltway issue that pits newly faith-friendly federal policies against those old secular progressive federal judges. And finally, it's clear that what some fearful and firm separatists mean when they wrote me about the separation of church and state, when they say state, is not just the quotidian machinery of public services at either the federal or the local level, but a, a more amorphous and far-reaching concept, the exercise of political authority in society. That's what they think should be free from divisive invocations of religion, especially invocations of one particular religion. Now, I'm not paid to have opinions, but I'll candidly admit that I have no idea where this debate is going. It's sobering for me to reflect on surveys that consistently show that fully one-third of adults, and according to a 2000 survey by the Knight Foundation, the same percentage of high school students think the First Amendment goes way too far 
in the freedoms it grants to us Americans. What impact the war on terror with its potential for a religious backlash here at home will have on this level of support for the cornerstone of the Bill of Rights is nothing that I feel too cheerful about. Now, it is true that the readers of the New York Times, an admittedly unrepresentative sample, came down pretty emphatically in favor of a future that preserves more rather than less of this elusive wall. They are particularly committed to what Ron Suskind has called, quote, a wall between official religion and political authority. Some said they get nervous when acts of government are explained by our political leaders as being part of God's plan for America. But few seem inclined to do anything about it, except worry. No letters to Congress, no demands for action, and no outcry against the use of religious imperatives in our political discourse. Of course, those who favor more religious accommodation, a lower wall, have made their equally emphatic case, not necessarily to me, but to their political allies in Washington. But some of those allies have lost some political ground lately with effects on that constituency that are not yet clear. And there is a tantalizing supply, useful for law school students, of important cases on this topic that are heading through the judicial pipeline right now. Some of them may very well move this portable wall in one direction or another fairly soon, given the key personnel changes on the Supreme Court. So where do we end up? Where do I end up? Well, it may be, as Jonathan Swift said of his own homeland, that America has just enough religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. But the strong passions that arise in this tug of war over the appropriate role of religion in our secular government may actually be good news for the vitality of our religious pluralism. Edmund Burke once observed, nothing is so fatal to religion as indifference. If that's the case, it seems to me that religion in America has very little to worry about, for we are anything but indifferent about it. Thank you very much for your attention. I stand ready to take your questions. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Enriquez, for uh, sterling remarks following and glossing a sterling four-part series. Uh, the floor is open to questions. May I discourage timidity? And may, may I encourage brevity? Uh, these are hard questions. They require really full and frank discussion. And may I ask you to put timidity aside, which I know is a great virtue in this law school, and to rush to the two microphones in the middle of the uh, auditorium and to use those to put your questions. But may I encourage them to be questions and not speeches. And may I encourage you to be brief and profound in putting your questions to Ms. Enriquez. Please. Mr. Hustons is breaking open the dam and the deluge <laughs> of questions that Ms. Enriquez will face. Please. Yes, Ms. Enriquez, you alluded to uh, the war on terror, and obviously there's you know, some talk of a clash of civilizations, and Islam may not be the most popular religion in America. And I was wondering if you've talked with politicians about that issue and about other minority religions that are less popular, maybe like Scientology or, or New Age religions. Um, have you spoken with uh, politicians about uh, the government support that would go to these uh, more minority religions? I haven't spoken with politicians about, uh, about those views, but I have observed a, a few interesting data points, if you will. Not enough yet to call it a trend, but um, some of you are aware uh, that there is pending in the hopper in Washington um, a bill that would allow um, uh, pastors to make political endorsements from their pulpits without endangering their tax-exempt status. Um, recently, there was a codicil, if you will, to that bill that was submitted by um, a congressman saying um, everybody but, uh, but imams would be covered by that. We don't want, you know, we don't want political endorsements in our mosques. Hmm, that struck me as odd and, and troubling. 
Um, I've also seen some reflections in, among those who are enamored of uh, faith-based prison rehabilitation programs, who are starting to say, ooh, faith-based. Uh, would that include Muslims? And often, of course, it does. So in those two realms, with respect to political engagement by religious leaders and prison reform programs for which, you know, dollar short officials don't ask many questions, I see this, the backdrop of the war on terror kind of starting to, to shadow over it. Um, I, I think it's early yet. I, in fact, was stunned as I asked my questions around and spoke to the people uh, at the Beckett Fund, for example, and in other places who are advocating a more accommodating stance. I was surprised at the failure to understand uh, that you know, an accommodation that sounds just great uh, to the American people for the majoritarian faith might not sound so great if you were extending it uh, much further and much more broadly. Um, and of course, we have no idea what's going to happen in terms of religious demographics in this nation going forward. At, you know, we're building uh, an understanding of the First Amendment that is going to survive you and me, I certainly hope. Uh, so. I think you've touched very, uh, uh, very wisely on uh, one of the real uh, nerve points in this debate that has yet to really fully blossom. Um, I'm concerned, I've said at breakfast, that I thought that we were one terrorist attack on domestic soil away from having that kind of backlash really start to splash into First Amendment issues. Um, but it's something clearly that, that needs to be watched because fearful people do really stupid things. So. Other questions? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, that was part of my question, but I would also like to you to reflect on difference in institutional structure. That is, the First Amendment and uh, the whole church and state relations have been premised on a Christian institutional structure of church or of religious communities. For Muslims, for Hindus, and other religions, that is not the case. How would that also play into your reflections? That's a very wise observation, um, this, this notion that um, a lot of these exemptions presuppose a very familiar religious organization. I mean, for example, uh, clearest case in point, the parsonage exemptions. These, these are the income tax uh, exemptions that permit what a ordained clergy, and actually the law actually says, quote, a minister of the gospel. That's what it says. But it allows members of an ordained, of ordained clergy to deduct from their taxable income that portion of their compensation that is designated as a housing allowance or the imputed value of the, the free parsonage if that's the form in which their housing allowance takes. Well. You know, that's great for those, those faith traditions that have a minister uh, or a paid minister. What about uh, Mormons, where the congregational leaders volunteer? Or what about uh, other uh, faith traditions, Hindu and Buddhist and Baha'i, where uh, the faith leader is, uh, is organic, I guess would be the best way to describe it. It arises organic out of the ranks of Quakers, for example. You know, don't even, you know, they don't have a minister. So clearly some of these exemptions were, were predicated on the assumption that they fit nicely with the uh, Judeo-Christian traditions and haven't been re-examined or reopened except in some instances of practice to see if they are disadvantaging other forms of faith um, as we become more, more pluralistic. Some of those um, disparities, though, are being adjusted regulatorily. I mean, the IRS no longer actually requires you to be a minister of the gospel, which is what the statute says in order to get that tax break. You can be a minister of the Torah as well, and they say in their, in their uh, documents, you know, we, we define that to mean minister. But they do define it in such a way that nuns, by the definitions that cover them in the Catholic Church, are not eligible for that uh, that tax break. So, I mean, 
you're absolutely right that there's a huge embedded legacy of uh, assumed Christianity or uh, Judeo-Christianity in many of these um, of these uh, exemptions, property tax exemptions, for example. I mean, great if you if you are part of a faith tradition where you've got to have a place to go worship. But what if you're a home-based religion? Or what if you're like the Wiccans and you just move from place to place? You don't own any property. You, know, you don't benefit from the, from the property tax exemptions either. So we're, um, we've become far more pluralistic than our exemptions have at present. Yes, sir. My question has to do with there seems to be a lot of change in the national government right now with a different looking Congress a new president in 2008. If some of President Bush's faith-based initiatives are rolled back legislatively, does your research indicate that the states would follow suit or that there would need to be a constitutional decision, let's say, from the courts for them to be able to do this? I think I'm right. I, I hate to put numbers. In, well, you all know that you know 97.3% of all statistics are made up on the spot, but there are I think several dozen, I'll do it that way, states that have already adopted state-level faith-based initiatives governing their uh, state appropriations. And there's more than 100 cities that have done so with respect to city appropriations. So I don't think that the change in balance, um, that's one reason I don't think the change in balance in Washington is going to mean, meaningfully roll back the concept of, of the faith, the concepts that underlie the faith-based initiatives, which is that religious organizations should not be discriminated against uh, in the awarding of uh, public uh, grants and contracts. Um, it is, as you know, uh, an initiative that has been instituted by executive order only, so actually no legislative action, with one exception, is necessary to roll it back. Uh, the next executive, the next white uh, president, need only not issue his own or her own um, executive orders, and it will it will lapse. The one exception to that is the charitable choice provision in the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, and a subsequent piece that was built into a later piece of social service legislation. Uh, that is structural, that's statutory, and that would have to be changed. However, that passed with remarkable bipartisan support. Uh, don't don't mistake our political landscape here. The notion of extending. Uh, special accommodations and special tax breaks and special visa programs and special uh, uh, property tax uh, um, treatment to religious organizations is not a Republican issue. It has occurred in, uh, in state legislatures controlled by, bo by both parties. Uh, it has occurred both during uh, Democratic administrations at the federal level and Republican administrations. Um, Certainly you can see in terms of political alliances a close fit between uh, some elements of the uh, Christian uh, and uh, traditional Jewish groups and the Republican Party. But don't assume thereby that when they're not in charge anymore, if that day comes, um, that you know, that's the end of any new religious accommodations. I, I sincerely doubt it, looking at the bipartisan support that has uh, um, uh, has uh, been garnered by all of the uh, landmark religious accommodation bills since the uh, since 1999 uh, the, and the 101st Congress. Uh, yes. Hello. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is the first is tailored towards your expertise as a financial reporter, um, and is simply to educate me on a few things I don't know. And um, the second is uh, a little more for reaching on your broader problem. Well, I'll be happily standing on that firmer ground <laughs> okay. on the, as a financial reporter. The first one is simply uh, your mention of the Alabama daycare case, or, yes. or the um, scenario where the, the complaint there was that, that the Alabama daycare, a secular organization, secular nonprofit, was finding it difficult to compete with the religious nonprofits in the area. Mm -hmm. My simple question is, um, what is the value of competition among uh, nonprofits um, if, there is, if there's a, uh, a benefit that the uh, community is looking to in gender, um, why is that? Um, why is it necessary that there be competition amongst them to get that benefit, um, or to get that you know, that government benefit? And my second question is, um, with respect to 
your, um, your broader project that you mentioned of how we're going to view the, the First Amendment um, coming out of these cases and what has been going on with uh, congressional action. Um, I wonder if the, if the concern is really that we're not going to be, that religion is going to infiltrate the public sphere, but actually particular religions are going to infiltrate the public, the public sphere. Why not read the First Amendment as um, a robust um, uh, a, a robust affirmation of the value of religion in public life and then apply equal protection constitutional arguments to make sure that those that um, are religious are being equally protected as opposed to trying to um, adhere and cling to a wall of separation that doesn't appear in the First Amendment at all. Well, let me tackle the second one uh, uh, before the first. Uh, what you've enunciated is essentially the idea that's contained in Ice Gruber and uh, um, in Ice Gruber's book. Uh, he, they argue for a concept of equal liberty um, in rejecting uh, separation as a useful metaphor. They apply a concept of equal liberty and uh, try to navigate their way back through past uh, uh, Supreme Court decisions to find a thread of exactly that you know, personal liberty protection, anti-discrimination component in them. Um, I, I don't get, I don't ha fortunately have to come up with a way to define the First Amendment to do my job, at least not the first 16 words. The next 10 words are a little more problematic, but um, the, uh, the emerging concept of uh, trying to plant uh, the notion of, of equal liberty for all religious groups is in, in, indeed an intriguing one. Now, when you go into that, in that direction, although it, it saves us a lot of problems on many fronts, there are some deeply embedded religious accommodations that um, would become illegal under that, uh, under that treatment, uh, property tax exemption being one of them. Uh, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to fit that within that, that concept of um, you know, making sure that the state doesn't uh, benefit religion at the expense of, uh, of other interests. So, I think while it, yeah, it would be great to say, here's how we're going to define the First Amendment, um, we're a long, long way from getting there. These cases don't come along in exactly the package that will allow you to get to some of these uh, results, although there are some fascinating cases coming up uh, before the Supreme Court in the pipeline. Uh, none of them, for example, are tailored that would, in a way that would give us, at least none of the ones I'm aware of, why I'm standing here in front of the world's leading experts on this, so uh, take that for what it's worth. But uh, none of the ones I'm aware of would are likely to lead to an outcome at the Supreme Court level that's going to move us one bit closer to, uh, uh, to your suggested interpretation. Looking at the regulatory uh, imbalances in, uh, in Alabama, I can, I can offer it most simply as um, if, if we draw the analogy of for-profit businesses and in fact some of the daycare programs that are disadvantaged by the faith-based exemption in Alabama are for-profit daycare programs. Um, the, uh, it's, it's harder to evaluate, it's harder to defend the disparate treatment when you're dealing with a non-profit a secular nonprofit versus a religious nonprofit. They both, you know, are out there doing good without seeking profit. But obviously, for-profit groups are disadvantaged as well. And, and in fact, we're among a handful of daycare centers that went to court to challenge that disparate treatment uh, in the federal courts. Um, and a federal court judge told them, go away, don't bother me. Um, I don't see any problem here. So it has, in fact, been upheld. But unlike some states, Alabama allows state daycare vouchers to be spent in non-licensed daycare centers. And as a result, a large and growing percentage of the women who receive uh, state vouchers under the welfare to work programs are spending those vouchers at faith-based centers because they go further there than they do in the more expensive licensed facilities. Um, and you know, look at any four, if, if two for-profit businesses are competing in a marketplace and one of them doesn't pay property taxes and the other one does, 
It's clear that the cost structure is different for the two, and therefore the pricing structure will be different for the two. And the, you know, the, all other things being equal and the law of supply and demand not having been repealed, the, less, the lower priced daycare program is going to be at an advantage in, uh, in the marketplace among people who are shopping for price. Um, you know, disparate licensing like that is sort of a, a Gresham's Law kind of problem. If it's, if it's worthwhile to license any daycare center, if there's, if there's a state interest in licensing and establishing standards for any daycare center, which you have to have so much square pace, space per child, so many staff members per child, so many entrances, so many uh, uh, safety precautions and so forth, and that you have to prove you've done that by getting a state license. But if you're faith-based, you don't. You not only don't have to get the state license, you don't have to comply. Then your costs of doing business are much small, uh, much lower, and you can uh, profit, well, not profitably, you can uh, operate at a break-even, assuming you're a, uh, not uh, a for-profit operation. You can operate uh, at a break-even at, uh, at a much lower fee for your, uh, your people. Now, Maybe that's fine. Maybe um, you should leave to the marketplace, to the individual shopper, whether they care enough about a licensed facility to spend more for it. Um, I can I can make that argument. I'm you know I believe in marketplaces, um, consumer choice, and so forth. the The state has its thumb on the scale a little bit with respect to the uh, the vouchers, but. Uh, I can, I can live with that one, too. If I were engaged in running a daycare program in Alabama, I'd probably have a different point of view about it. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> like my colleague, I have two questions, but I'll let you pick. Uh, you could pick either one uh, to respond. Okay. I think speaking, there's one more. Speaking of consumer choice. <laughs> I think there's one more qu person who has a question. Um, in your article, one of the things you talk about as kind of an argument for the special exemptions and benefits that uh, religious groups get um, under First Amendment law is the sense that they're providing a charitable um, contribution to the public sphere. So the way in which they open up hospitals, daycare facilities, soup kitchens, and the like. But, um, and you say that uh, also for-profit, non-profit organizations provide the same function but don't get the same benefits and exemptions. I guess one of the things I want to ask you is, is, there, is are there other benefits that religious groups may provide to the public sphere above and beyond uh, the charitable function? Uh, for example, I know there are some scholars, religious scholars, who talk about the role of religion as a meaning-making institution in society. Mm -hmm and the way in which it serves as an alternative sphere or even a society that helps to kind of fund democratic principles and ideals that even help the larger society. So I guess, my, do you buy that is, is, is kind of my question with that. Um, are there other intrinsic things, intangible things that religion provides to the public sphere that may justify them getting these particular exemptions. And I guess the other question is, 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 is interesting, uh, you, you point to the bipartisan support for these exemptions and benefits. Um, might this in some way point to an interesting uh, trend that we, I think, often miss by defining the kind of rising influence of religion in the public domain as a kind of an expression of uh, religious conservatism? and fundamentalism kind of taking over. Might democratic support also point to the fact that there is an increasing involvement of liberal Christian or religious groups in society that are trying to impact the public, the public sphere well, that we've often missed? The, I, I didn't miss it, um, the, the involvement of liberal churches. Uh, they were, those ministers were at the front of the, uh, the March on Selma. Those ministers were at the front of the civil rights movement. Um, my current minister is a you know, social justice kind of guy. He got the first homeless shelter opened in Hoboken over the objections of the local uh, government, took them to court to, uh, uh, to uh, defend the right of uh, one of the local churches, 
supported by a coalition of clergy to open its basement to homeless people. So there's nothing new about uh, uh, churches of a more liberal political persuasion being involved in trying to shape public policy. I mean, the, uh, the whole, I mean, the Volstead Act, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, abolition of, uh, of liquor sales in the country, that, that arose from a, a religious um, uh, movement. And the abolitionists in, this, in the anti-slavery movement were uh, largely uh, acting out of religious uh, uh, beliefs and imperatives. So there's nothing new about religious groups um, having and forcefully expressing an opinion about public policy. Um, I don't, uh, I can't imagine an environment in, when that, in which that would not be the case. Um, Looking at your first question, though, I'm a bit troubled uh, by the assumption. First of all, I must, I must correct, though, I know it's a common uh, usage and you meant nothing by it. I didn't argue anything in that series. Uh, I did talk to some people who made the argument that, among them Douglas Laycock, for example, that these intrinsic goods that society receives from organizations could be seen as a justifying basis for these exemptions. The problem with that is, I mean, just as, a, as another uh, uh, person huddling under the, the shade of the First Amendment, when you start deciding uh, public policy on such highly subjective grounds, um, I get nervous. Because I'm not sure in this day and age that there are many people who think that newspapers, for example, provide some intrinsic service to society. Um, I hope there are some. Um, it is my livelihood, after all, and I do think it's an important component to constitutional democracy to have a free press. But if I had to depend on the kindness of strangers and the agreement of strangers in the worth of my mission to hang on to that, those next ten words, to freedom of speech and of the press, I'd be real nervous about that. And so as a religious person, I don't want... Uh, a, a, a structure of exemptions and tax breaks that is defended and justified by the public's opinion about how great religion is. If they're valid as exercises of discretion, fine. If the courts do not see them as offending the First Amendment, fine. But let's not reduce this to a popularity contest so that people who believe that there are these greater goods beyond just the charitable services, there are these intrinsic goods that arise from uh, particular religious activities that society should value enough to protect them. Because history is a little too blood spattered uh, for us to take much shelter under that. The very same debate would have standing on the other side of it someone who would say, can we deduct from that intangible uh, total the loss of life in religious wars, the damage done in uh, uh, religiously inspired mobs? So I don't want that calculus evolving as a foundation for uh, First Amendment protections. I think that the way to think about these are the ways that have been suggested by some earlier questions, which is how do the state and the church interact with each other? They must in a, in a complex society. They must. What are the ground rules? How do we maintain um, a pluralistic society where people feel they have freedom of conscience that nobody becomes a second-class citizen based on internal beliefs about the spiritual world. How do we, how do we maintain that with, uh, without throwing lots of babies out with the bathwater, lots of good things that society derives uh, from that practice of religious freedom? Um, I'm, I'm concerned that there will be a backlash against the highly politicized expressions of religion that will attempt to, to uh, shove the pendulum back in the other direction. Um, 
and, and exacerbate the, the cultural collide that we have. So my personal belief, a long-winded way of answering, my personal belief is obviously I, religion adds meaning to my life and has my whole life long. Um, but I don't want to feel like society has um, singled my faith out or any faith out as uh, for special treatment because of the meaning that it adds to people's lives. It's too subjective. Um, it's, it's too difficult to, uh, uh, to, to weigh and to balance, and it should not be the basis under which we protect uh, religious pluralism. Yes, ma'am. You suggested um, in your lecture that it might be helpful to distinguish between um, what's rooted in belief and institutional beliefs and goals. And in one of your pieces, you're talking about um, hiring and the um, lack of rights that um, employees in religious institutions uh, may have, um, and th that religious institutions are um, allowed to engage in religious discrimination. And sometimes this results in gender bias and uh, sexual orientation discrimination. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you would, uh, def what category you would put hiring practices in, if that would be something that you would consider rooted in belief or an institutional belief and goal. Hmm. Well, clearly hiring practices are an institutional activity primary at the first stage. In some faith traditions, they are also a, a matter of belief, but not in all. And in some faith traditions, it's changed over time with respect to, uh, uh, to hiring. Um, the, the tricky part comes, of course, with public funding. Um, public funding that's used to finance activities that then practice religious discrimination, particularly if it's a form of religious discrimination that is um, preclusive of particular genders or particular sexual orientation uh, is, is one of the really intractable problems arising out of the faith-based initiative. That, in fact, is the reason most people think that it has not been congressionally enacted. That's the rock on which the legislation kept cracking apart. Uh, okay, if, you know, if uh, XYZ Church gets a federal grant a federal a contract to provide services, and they run an ad in the paper that says Christians only with federal money. How can that be right? How can that be uh, what this nation's supposed to stand for? It's, it is on that rock that people have just been unable to resolve uh, the issue. Um, hiring spiritual leaders, the, uh, the first part of your question assumed uh, the ministerial exception. That is that judicial policy in which the courts will not enter into employment disputes between a religious organization and its spiritual leaders, a, a, a category which is being expandingly defined by the courts. That is to say, more and more kinds of workers find that they cannot go to court to redress employment um, uh, disputes. Uh, it falls into such a fact-specific uh, area that um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the Solomon that has to figure that out. In the series, we looked at situations where uh, religious employees had been fired while um, suffering serious life-threatening diseases and thereby had lost their health insurance with cataclysmic uh, results, both for their health and for their finances. Um, and in both, in both of these cases, one a, one a Jewish rabbi and the other a Catholic nun, they uh, had lawyers who were so offended by this that in both cases on a pro bono basis, the lawyers challenged uh, their dismissals in the courts and lost the courts finding that troubling as this was, it was not something that the courts should get engaged in. And as a, a vestry member at my church, I don't want some federal judge telling me who we have to hire as our spiritual leader. Um, but taking a, a, a page from um, Ice Gruber's book, he suggests that you can get through the hiring discrimination thicket 
uh, on the back of the law of associations, voluntary associations. The government um, would be widely seen as going way too far if they were to tell you who your mentor on campus ought to be or who um, uh, you ought to consult for grief counseling. I mean, you, you know, no one would stand for the government in, intruding on your right of privacy and free association so, uh, so ham-fistedly. And Eisgruber's argument is that that's how we get to protecting the hiring decisions of religious organizations, not by exempting them from the anti-discrimination laws, but by protecting them under these rights of association that have that, that hiring your spiritual leader is akin to choosing your grief counselor and the government ought to butt out on that decision. Um, as I said, I'm not paid to have opinions, so I haven't answered your question about what I think about all this, but I, I do think, and you've put your finger right on what is one of the most um, troubling and, and intractable parts of this division, and frankly, a part of this research that for me was most personally um, uh, torturous. Um, by, I've, I've served on pastoral search committees for my sins. I mean, it, it, it's just impossible to find a candidate on which you know, you're going to be able to get more than a marginal majority of your congregation um, approving. So I know how hard it is to, uh, to, for religious organizations to, to operate within that uh, hiring structure. But I also hear the pain of uh, people who feel they have been treated unfairly by their religious organizations uh, and have no redress. In fact, in my life as a um, uh, senior warden at my church, I am, am taking steps to make sure that our contracts with our staff going forward, they will be renewed in July, include uh, strong arbitration clauses so that our workers are protected from, because I had no idea that if uh, you know, we, we fired one of our uh, uh, rectors, assistant rector just because she'd gotten pregnant and fired her in the middle of her pregnancy and took away, I had no idea that she would have no recourse against us, that we could, we could treat her com with complete impunity. So I'm taking steps to make sure that our contracts with them, apart from the court system, give them really strong protections so that long after I'm gone, uh, they, will, uh, they, they won't find themselves in these situations. Um, but th these, were, these were terribly troubling um, issues and no easy issues. Um, what I, the reason I focused on it and gave a, an entire s uh, part of the series over to employment issues um, is because that's, that's where some of the worst battles here where everybody's right uh, arise. Um, so that, that's a long-winded way of, of saying I don't have an opinion on that, but it is, uh, it is the point at which uh, an awful lot of, uh, um, uh, of theories of First Amendment interpretation crack apart. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Diana. Oh, hi. Hi. hi Amy. The question I have is now that you have brought this trend of the increasing accommodation to light, um, what, what happens next? Are other media picking up on this issue? Are other people exploring it, delving into it, trying to bring it out more? And if so, how, how are you seeing that? And if not, why do you think not? Um, I haven't seen any big national media attention to it, although there was uh, some flurry after, um, uh, after the series first ran. Um, I was on the uh, NPR, did a piece. I did a, you know, a few of those. Um, post-series exercises. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can take credit for it, but I am seeing, because I monitor the religious uh, exemption news all across the country, I'm seeing a lot better and more local news coverage about these issues. Um, one of the, one of the uh, examples I used in my series was about a little church in Indiana that had gotten a million and a half dollar tax exempt revenue bond package to build a new uh, a new uh, social hall next to the church. Well, that had gotten almost no attention 
in its localities. Uh, the next one of those church wants tax exempt revenue bond stories that popped up did get a lot of attention elsewhere not in Indiana, it happened to be in a nearby state, but it did get more attention. I am seeing uh, some increased attention to issues um, like about the faith-based initiative, about the use of uh, public services for religious organizations. Not all of it is particularly well informed, uh, but it, it, it has at least, it does at least suggest to me that some of my colleagues have started to think differently about how to look at uh, these actions of uh, state and local uh, uh, state laws and local ordinances through a First Amendment lens, which they had not done before. And I can prove that they hadn't done it before because I can go back to earlier stories about some of the situations um, that I ultimately wrote about, and you won't find the phrase First Amendment or separation of church and state in any of that coverage. It's do we have enough votes to pass it? Uh, you know, which uh, uh, properties would be affected and so forth. It's purely local, political, and governmental thought. And now I'm beginning to see that somewhere in the newsroom, some editor, bless him, who reads the New York Times, um, is saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's look at the, the, the constitutional issues are being raised. Uh, but by and large, I think we have not yet seen um, a large groundswell of national attention uh, to this issue. One reason is that the national news magazines uh, can tell you how many more issues a week they sell uh, when there's something related to religion on the cover, as long as it's something um, favorable towards religion. Uh, so they're unlikely to, uh, to delve into is any issues that readers would interpret the way my series was interpreted by many readers as being hostile towards religion. It's just not good, not good business. Um, so um, I hope that it continues to be covered. I hope it continues to be covered um, more effectively and more intelligently. The programs you guys operate do an awful lot to help uh, educate uh, both readers and, uh, and uh, future citizens about, uh, about proceeding with that. One last question, I think. Um, in your article from this past fall, you talk about how some of these church organizations sort of have their cake and eat it too and that they're not uh, subject to some taxes and the increased costs that come along with regulation. Uh, then you go on to talk about how they still have some of the public benefits like fire safety. And you say that there's never really been a survey nationally that addresses these costs that are thrust upon other tax paying citizens. Yep. Uh, my question basically as a financial reporter, do you think that it's possible for such a survey uh, to happen and how compelling uh, evidence would you anticipate would come out of that? It's possible, and we were discussing this at uh, um, uh, dinner last night uh, because it is such an intriguing question. Uh, the only state I could find, and we really looked hard, that produces this data regularly, annually, and in a usable county-by-county -county format is Colorado. Happily, Boulder is in Colorado, and Boulder was one of the stories I was focusing on. But uh, other states, if they collect it at all at the state level, don't disclose it. Most of them don't collect it. If they collect it, they do not often uh, aggregate uh, religious properties apart from schools and other nonprofit uh, uses. It would have to happen, I'm afraid to tell you, at the county level. There are, does anyone know how many thousands of counties in this country? There are like 4,000 counties in the country. Um, there are associations of county tax assessors. You might be able to go to them and say, how about we do this? You know, give us some data. Give, let's, let us start collecting this. It's unclear to me why they would cooperate with you since it would be burdensome and expensive to, uh, uh, to do. Um, I wish we had that data. Um, but the assumption is, in, embedded in your question, that if we knew the answer to that question, we'd do something differently. And I'm not at all persuaded that we would. I think that's why no one has pursued the question. There's no appetite anywhere um, to take, to put religious property back on the tax rolls. Now, as religious property gets more and more imaginatively defined, that pressure is starting to build in some localities. So 
Fast forward a few years where mission creep has uh, prompted every uh, church in the country to think that they need a fitness club to attract uh, new members and that they need um, um, a, a sidewalk cafe to serve their uh, um, uh, their congregants on uh, on Sundays and uh, and then all of those should be tax exempt and and you know upscale retirement communities proliferating everywhere uh, seeking tax exemptions that might start creating the financial pressures that would prompt someone to say we maybe we should change this and if we had those numbers that would help us change it but absent the appetite to change, I don't see any appetite to get the numbers. I, I looked. I wished I'd had them. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. Well, thank you, Ms. Enriquez, for a wonderful um, forum this afternoon. Uh, for all of your uh, claims of being an amateur, you have shown yourself yet again to be uh, a judicious, uh, a very wise, and a remarkably eloquent um, revealer, investigator, and conversationalist about some of these searing questions of the weightier matters of the law and the weightier matters of faith. I want to, uh, that was such a wimpy applause. I would like you to have a robust applause for Ms. Enriquez. We're so grateful for the privilege of having you here at our center. It would help us a lot if you would do us the kindness of taking that little yellow insert in your program and letting us know how you found out about this forum, letting us know how we can reach you better, giving us your contact information so that we can send you information about forthcoming events, including our major silver anniversary conference, October 24 to 26, that will bring 25 superstars to this lectern. I hope you'll join me in a round of applause to thank my colleagues in the center, particularly Amy Wheeler and April Bogle, who choreographed this event, and Scott Andrews and Corky Gallo, who have been our faithful media folk throughout. We stand adjourned with appreciation for your being here. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.